All right, welcome back to Benefits of Bipolar. I'm Lee Fermella. Uh, I weird to say, but I'm your host. I guess I better get used to that if I'm going to keep doing this. But today, super lucky. Um, I reached out to the person you see on your screen as well recently to see if she would come on the channel. Um, I'd like to introduce Schizo Kitto on YouTube at Schizo Kitto on IG, but better known as just Kit. Kit, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Um, you are the, so the reason I wanted to have you on, I guess I'll just make it obvious from the start. I've only had people on who live with bipolar disorder or my girlfriend who lives with somebody who lives with bipolar disorder. So I've not had anybody on with schizoaffective disorder at all. Um, so that was the main reason that and your videos are fantastic. And I love your lighting. I love your little shorts and, and, and your, your Instagram reels. They're just wonderful. So I'm going to start there. Do you want to start by explaining kind of yourself? Give us a little introduction and then go from there and, and help me out and help the viewers out. What is schizoaffective disorder? How does that differ from bipolar disorder? So schizoaffective disorder, the way I usually bring it up to people is that I say that it's a condition where someone experiences symptoms of schizophrenia, such as delusions and hallucinations, but also symptoms of a mood disorder, which can resemble either major depressive disorder or in my case, bipolar disorder. The biggest difference between schizoaffective disorder and bipolar disorder with psychotic features is that by, di by diagnosis, by the textbook, essentially, one has to have psychotic symptoms outside of a mood episode for a period of two weeks or longer in order to be diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder. If the psychosis only happens when you're in a mood episode, then it's bipolar. Okay, thank you. That, that makes so much more sense. I, I, I love how all of these, the DSM-5 is in weeks. Like it's, it's very laid out. You have to have a certain amount of week for it to be mania in bipolar disorder. And apparently it's got to be, say again, two weeks. Two weeks or longer. Yeah. Okay. Outside of an episode. So that's the main. Outside of a mood episode. Yes. Yeah, okay. so you essentially have to have psychotic symptoms and mood symptoms together congruently. And then you also have to have psychotic symptoms outside of that mood episode for two weeks or longer. Okay. Dang. That is not only confusing, but to, to get the diagnosis, but I can't imagine how much confusing that must be for you to try and keep track of then which one you're going through if you're going through either one of those at all. Is that the case also? Well, really for me, it's not as, it sounds complicated. Like what I just said sounds complicated, but really for me, it's almost like I just have like bipolar one disorder with voices. So it's like, oh. I have everything that bipolar one disorder has, but then I also just have voices that I hear when I'm not in episodes. Sure. So which one, or I, let me ask you this then, were you diagnosed as schizoaffective disorder right away or did it take a few? Yeah. Okay. That, I'm not going to lie. I kind of saw a little bit of online, but I wanted to ask and make sure because it wasn't, your smile says it all. Walk us through it, Kit. Well, where did it start? <laughs> oh my gosh. So when I was in the eighth grade, although actually it can go even further back than that. So when I was younger, when I was really little, I used to get in these things that I would call cleaning moods, where I would just get this urge to clean anything and everything. And I do it until like one or 2 a.m. to the point where when my mother would tell me to clean my room, I'd be like, just wait till I have a cleaning mood and then I'll do it. Looking back on it, those were probably my earliest manic symptoms. How old like, were you? Lack of a better term. It's like, I, as long back as I can remember, really? like five, okay. six, seven, sure. maybe. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just, I, I just called them cleaning moods. Um, but yeah. things didn't really start getting like worse until I was in the eighth grade. And in eighth grade, a lot of things happened to me. I started experiencing depression for the first time. I didn't even think about any hypomanic anything, but I started experiencing depression. And that was when the first voice in my head showed up. So wow. I started talking with him one night and then it's just like, he just never went away. He was just always there. His name was Twilight. He was pretty cool. Um, but I went to my parents and I said, Hey, I think I'm depressed. I didn't mention the voice, but I'm like, sure. I think I'm depressed. I think I need to see someone. They both bless their hearts. They didn't know anything about mental health. They're like, no, 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 you're fine. Just deal with it kind of thing. Um, so, and really like I said, they didn't really know any better because back right. then mental health wasn't nearly as a big of a deal as it is today. Um, yeah. but from like, from the time between eighth grade to my senior year of high school, things steadily got worse to the point where when it was my senior year I was 18 and I remember being happy in one class and then sad the next sure. um crying sometimes for 30 minutes and then after that I'd be like tie the kite and it was yeah. this rapid cycling mess um it'd probably be something similar to mixed 
episodes at this yeah. point, but it was just, it was just a really bad up and down by the oh, hour yeah. thing for me. And I remember swinging on a hammock with my boyfriend at the time saying, Hey, do you think I might be bipolar? And he went, maybe. And so after a breakdown in my doctor's office, she sent me to a psychiatrist and I was diagnosed with something called cyclothymia, which is basically baby bipolar. It's yeah. um, your highs don't meet enough to be a hypomanic episode and the lows don't meet enough criteria to be depression, but it's kind of characterized by a rapid cycling mood state. Mm -hmm. um, I was put on lamotrigine, which I'm still on to this day. And that really helped the bipolar depression. So, and that was where I was. Then I went to college. College was stressful. So <laughs> probably <laughs> yeah. I, I started, yeah, college, college was stressful. I'm amazed I made it. I'm amazed I made it through, made it through. Um, but I had broken up with my first girlfriend and I sunk into this really deep depression that the med I was taking was not doing its job. So I went sure. to my doctor and said, Hey, I really, I can't get out of bed. I, I, I can't go to all my classes. Like I'm really struggling. Like this is destroying my life. And he diagnosed me with bipolar too. So I moved yeah. up a rung because of the depression. He put me on uh, more, like he put me on lithium, yay lithium. And um, yeah. And then that was my diagnosis for a while. And I kind of wasn't really getting the medication I needed because I was keeping out the fact that I was experiencing psychosis oh. and I didn't know that I was experiencing psychosis, but I had these voices that I would hear. They were regulars and I would hear them constantly and hmm. they would talk to me, but it wasn't distracting. Like they would stay away when I was like doing homework or something. And then they'd help me out on a test, frankly, like they were my friends. Like, honestly, they were my friends. Wow. I didn't really have mean ones or anything. So I didn't see them as a problem. And they were also on the inside of my head. So it wasn't like I was hearing them as someone was in the room with me. They were inside my head like thoughts. And I didn't know that that could be a thing. So I thought it was just me creative talking to myself, creatively talking to myself. Yeah. So more time passes. I'm like sitting in the bipolar two diagnosis, dealing with depression and all that stuff. And then, then in 2018, I graduated, I graduated college and I moved to New York city. And there was where I had my psychotic break, lost absolutely everything. Ugh. And my doctor, who I had told what had happened, like, hey, I hear these voices, hear everything. He actually diagnosed me with bipolar one disorder. Okay. okay. And so I was like, okay, I'm bipolar now, like bipolar one now. Okay, this is a thing. And more time passed. And I'm like, I should really tell him that I hear the voices all the time. And so I did. And in 2020, I was diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder. Okay. So yeah, that's wow. the short version. So how long, so from eighth grade till, so what is that like 10, 11 years for the full diagnosis to take shape, if you will? Um, let's see. So probably like 10 or 11 years, a decade. Yeah, 10, 11 years. Okay. So, wow. Yeah. So that that is, that is a wild story because you don't mm -hmm. often hear somebody going in for the help right away. And then, I mean, you always hear about misdiagnoses. I think we hear about that in bipolar and schizophrenia and major depression. I think you hear about that a lot and <laughs> trying to figure yeah. out what medications work, what have you, but it's just, it, that took, that took such a long time for you with so many, I mean, similar in ways, diagnoses, but I guess, I, and, and I don't want this to come off the wrong way, Kit. So please hear me. <laughs> Cause I think it's true for me too. When I look back, Honesty is the most important part of getting the correct diagnosis. If you could tell anybody else out there right now, like how to get the right diagnosis, tell them everything, I guess is what I'm hearing. If, if I Yeah, no, that's, yeah, that was my issue is that one, I didn't realize that the voices I was hearing were voices. Right. Um, and scary. then two, once I realized they were voices, I was embarrassed. I was like, well, yeah. it's not good. And yeah. so if I had been honest with, my doctor when I first talked to him when I was in high school I, it might have turned out differently because a lot of my struggles in college stemmed from the fact that I wasn't on an antipsychotic I wasn't on a medication that would actually treat what was going on like we were trying to fix like what was up with me right but yeah. it wasn't it wasn't enough and so I was always up and always down like I didn't experience euthymia for the first time until after I went on an antipsychotic medication Okay. Okay. And for those who aren't as well versed as Kit, that's stability. <laughs> living with the sense, sense or a state of stability while living with bipolar disorder. I love that word. It's one of my favorites. Also one of the most elusive things in my life, but we try. <laughs> we try. Um, so, oh, where was I going to go with that, Kit? 
I forgot now. Well, so 11 years, that's right. Okay, so what medication ultimately ended up being the one that was a game changer for you? Because you said you started off with Lamictal, how, and then you went to uh, lithium, but that didn't last very long? So that, that's the that's the interesting thing about psychiatric treatment is that when you have a condition that's really complicated, severe and everything, medications change a lot. Like it's yeah. just because I'm on one medication two years ago, doesn't mean I'm going to be on the same one today. And it definitely doesn't mean I'm going to be on the same dosage. So it took it took a while. So I went on Lamotrigine in high school and I still take that one to this day. I take almost the same dose I've taken the entire time. And that one still helps treat my bipolar depression for sure. Like I know it does because every time we try to lower it, I just get depressed again. Not cool. Um, I'm on lithium because it helps treat the also bipolar depression. It prevents bipolar disorder from coming back. Lithium is one of the most effective psychiatric treatments we have and its true value lies in its ability to prevent bipolar relapse. And there's a bunch of other health benefits too. But the medication that really, really got me to where I am today um, is Zyprexa, which is an antipsychotic medication. And the cool thing about antipsychotics, specifically second generation ones, which is like what Zyprexa is, is that they act on both serotonin and dopamine receptors, which hmm. means that they help mood stuff and psychotic stuff. So really oh, for me, Zyprexa, cool. yes, it keeps my voices away and keeps horrific dilutions away and other stuff, but it actually stabilizes my moods really well. Like I haven't had a manic episode since I went on it. Like I went on it because I got a manic episode and then I haven't had one since it's like insane nice. how well it works. So, how long yeah. that so it's a combination of meds. How long has that been then? So I've been on Zyprexa. Yeah. Uh, probably coming up on six years. There was a period nice. of a few months where I tried something else, but I went back on it. But yeah, I'd say, I think six years because I went on it in 2018. Yeah. Nice. So do you still, I guess one of my curiosities then, so you haven't had a manic episode in six years then. Is that accurate? Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah, manic. Yes, manic. Not hypermanic. Manic. Yeah, right, man. Oh, okay. All right. So there, okay. there comes the, the my next question. So you still obviously, by your smile at that clarification, you do still have episodes. They're still, they're just more in range. Does with the antipsychotic, do you still have the voices and the delusions just in a similar way where they're in a more manageable range or what does that look like now for you? So it's really interesting because I do still hear voices. I just don't hear them very often. So like a couple of times a week, maybe, and it'll okay. be like a little fleeting comment or something. I often don't have like a long conversation with them. Uh, but they'll show up a few times a week. Um, as for delusional stuff, I have a few persistent delusions that occasionally like to rear their head. And I know I know that they're delusions when they're happening, but it's very hard to um, to uh, not believe them because that's the thing about delusions is you do yeah. believe them. And so it's Absolutely. like me sitting here in my brain trying to logic my out of it, but I can't do that. So I just have to kind of like hang on tight and just be like, oh, I don't want to think this thing, but it's, it'll go away, it'll go away. And then it, it goes, it goes away, so interesting still get those symptoms it's just that they're they're far more manageable than they were before huh so what is so when i hear i'm sorry i'm just very fascinated by this because when i hear you say something like that where it's a delusion or a delusional thought it's like god dang if i didn't have those when i was before i was diagnosed I mean, that's exactly what it sounded like my brain was doing i would get just focused on a suicidal thought <clears throat> somebody at work hates me and they're trying to get me fired and they're trying to take all my money or whatever else. And that's the only thing I'm thinking. Is there in your experience or because you're so incredibly well-researched, I want to give you so much credit for that because I think I'm, I know a decent amount and I do a lot of reading, but it's obvious to me that you do so much more, <laughs> so much more reading than most people do. And it's so much more knowledge than most people do. What's then the difference between for you or, or what you've read between a bipolar delusion and a schizophrenic delusion or schizoaffective delusion, are they similar? Are they the same thing? What makes them different if there is anything? Um, actually, it, delusions are just a symptom of psychosis and psychosis is found in bipolar disorder. It's found in schizophrenia, it's found in schizoaffective. Okay. So really there's the only, I mean, I guess the only difference you could think is that if, if it's a bipolar if it's in bipolar disorder it'll go away when the episode ends but if it's schizophrenia oh. or schizoaffective it won't necessarily thank yeah. you see and there, there there it comes from again the the in in an episode and out of an episode that seems to be mm -hmm. the so god so that's that's just another layer of really truly just stress and self-awareness and vigilance for you it sounds like because like at least 
with bipolar, if I do reach a state of euthymia for a while, I'm always aware, like, oh, gosh, did I get enough sleep? Oh, is that a depressive thought? Am I heading in which direction? But in reality, your other symptoms can just pop up out of nowhere then. Mm -hmm. Yep. Ugh. Absolutely. I sometimes get times where it's like, oh, cool, I'm a little bit hypomanic and I'm hearing things. And some days it's like, oh, I just have this, oh, someone I know is going to die a horrible death. That's horrible. Oh, God, I got to deal with this again. Because that's that's the main delusion yeah. I deal with. Is, it's like, this person's okay. going to die. And it's like, ah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I know I'm way too casual about it. I'm way too casual about it. But yeah, but, so it's... it's but, <laughs> but are you? Because if, if this is something we, would I think in many ways, we want other people to be more casual about it. Because we have to be able to talk about it. If it's life or death every time we talk about it, then it's life or death every day. Because I talk, <laughs> this is something we deal with every day. Is it not? That's actually, that is, that is very true. Yeah. In order to normalize this stuff, it should be talked about more. So yeah, I, sh I should give myself a little more credit. <laughs> Amen. See, and that's where I was going with it. <laughs> give yourself a lot more credit because that is the goal of it. Without you being willing to answer my questions, which I, obviously I don't know a heck of a lot of what I'm talking about in this realm, which is why I wanted to have you on. We won't learn more. So yes, give yourself a ton of credit because that's what you're doing. You are providing education. You're providing understanding. And that's my goal with this. We have to, because I hate that. Let me put it this way. Kid, I hate that we have to put trigger warnings on so many things. Maybe that makes me insensitive. Go. Everything. Go. Everything. Everything. Every... <laughs> I literally, in my videos, I always have to say like unalive. And then I have to say trigger warning. I want to talk about this. There's some things I really wish I could talk about that I can't because like YouTube won't let me talk about them. Yeah. Um, like I have, I really struggle, um, struggle actively, but also in the past um, with self-harm. That's my biggest oh. addiction that I've, I've had. And I cannot honestly, truly talk about it on the internet um, without potentially triggering people. Um, YouTube wouldn't monetize me. And it's like, this, this is, it's a huge part of my life and it's a huge thing I battle with. And it's very hard to not be able to talk about that just because society is like, hey, there's not really a safe place for you to talk about it. So that's exactly it. That's a, and that's exactly it. And you are not the only one who's dealt with these issues. <laughs> there are how many thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people out there who can benefit if we're able to get these messages out to them. I mean, that seems to be your goal from the beginning. And I don't know, I don't want to quote you, but tell me, talk to me, I guess a little bit more about this and that making the uncomfortable comfortable. Right. So the schizo Kitso as a project. Yeah. 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 Making the uncomfortable comfortable. Yeah. So schizo Kitso as a project was meant to, I wanted to share the reality of what living with a serious psychotic disorder is like, because I saw a lack of it because schizoaffective disorder, it's not really, it is common, but it's not as common as schizophrenia and it's not common as bipolar disorder. And so a lot of people just aren't talking about it. And I feel like there's not really a place for me, so to speak, because I don't quite fit in with bipolar people and I don't quite fit in with schizophrenics. I'm kind of stuck in the middle of those groups. So I kind of am trying to make a space for, for schizoaffectives essentially. And um, I love that part of, part of like the channel itself is also me talking about things that I haven't really seen people talk about. Like I'm pretty sure the average person that struggles with a mental disorder does not want to get in front of a camera and talk about how they lost their mind. Like yeah. the most horrible yeah. time of their entire life that traumatized them, like talk to a camera and then put that out on the internet. But I wanted to do that because if I could talk about that, then I could talk about anything with this disorder, except the things that I have to trigger warning. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But it was, so when I was originally coming up with the idea for the channel, I was talking with my dad and I said, dad, what if I just, what if it was just like, it's, it's about making the uncomfortable comfortable. And he's like, that's the tagline. Um, and that's really what I try to live by because there's many times where like, I will upload a video and I'm just like, do I really want to do this? Do I really want to put this out there? And then I have to remember making the uncomfortable comfortable. You're uncomfortable. If you want things to be normalized, you got to put it out there. You got to put it out there. And so I do, I show up, I post things and I keep making videos. And I'd like to tell you that it's gotten easier since I made the channel, but I still get incredibly uncomfortable all the time with just videos that I spend hours on, hours and hours and hours on. And it's just like, do I really want to put this out there? <sighs> yes, I do. But I have to kind of mm, like, oh, I'm not going to look at the phone for the first hour when it goes out. So 
exactly well thank you for doing that i mean and and it's not easy i mean as somebody who has put a picture up of me basically or i mean a video up of me basically crying in the middle of a deep depression and and mixed it yeah you you really don't want to but I, it it takes courage and and so and and if i'm being honest you have some videos out there that are tough to watch but in a good way in a way that I was able to relate with, you know, and, but the, but we have to be able to do that. We have to be able to have conversations. And for me, I love it especially more because what I found, I didn't gain any comfort in life until I was willing to be more uncomfortable than I've ever been ever before with loved ones, with therapists, with doctors, but mostly with myself. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it, so how, where, how did, I guess, being uncomfortable, you're, I feel like our entire lives are uncomfortable and we just want other people to be yeah. comfortable with our uncomfort. I like that. I actually like that a lot because it, like with, um, with any disability, it permeates every aspect of my life. And so it's very hard for me to do anything without the schizoaffective portion playing a role. It affects my daily life all the time. It affects almost yeah. every single thing I do. And if I don't talk about it, it's it's not gonna it's not gonna help me because it's affecting me. And sometimes I sometimes I need accommodation. Sometimes I need people to know, like, hey, I'm I'm hearing stuff. I gotta just give me a second. Give me a second. And so yeah, the, it's I'm trying to figure out where I was going with this. Um, yeah, no, is it? Yeah, I actually lost the train of thought entirely. <laughs> No, that's okay. That's okay. That's basically how my day is going. So we're, we're just on the same page there, but no worries. I, it, but it, it's because it's tough when you're talking about these things, we get passionate about them. And on top of it, I think that's a, actually, I want to use that. That's what happens in our brains. We are focused on living with bipolar or for you. I can't imagine. I mean, I, I, I can't imagine for certain things. If I'm unbelievably depressed, and I'm trying to focus for an eight hour workday, it is not going to happen. Because my brain is going to stop me every 30 seconds and tell me how depressed I am. Tell me how much I hate it. Tell me how much how terrible I am as a human being. I mean, how much of your energy goes towards exactly what we've talked about before, coping skills, focusing on where you're at with bipolar. Are you having delusions, whatever else? So that I guess that kind of brings it back around to manage all of the, the, everything that you deal with, what are some of the coping skills that you have found? Because I know you said you just, you dig in and get through it, but I, I know you're too, I know you're much, much, much smarter and much, much, much more knowledgeable than that. And probably have a full list of coping skills, life skills, and things that you've come up with. What are some of the ones that work best for you when things get really, really bad or just in general, what do you do every day to make sure that they don't get that bad? So there's something called dialectical behavior therapy or DBT, and it quite literally saved my life. It's the reason I can live on my own. It's the reason I can have a full-time job. It's the reason I can pursue my hobbies and not go insane, frankly. And DBT is divided into four sections, and hopefully I can remember all of them. Here First one is mindfulness, which is the art of living in the moment and being present in the moment and just enjoying the here and now because that's all we have. Uh, the second one is interpersonal skills, which basically is like, how do you do relationships? How do you get friends? How do you maintain relationships and improve things? And how do you take care of your self-respect and validation? And then there's distress tolerance, which is how do you handle crisis situations? So there's some crisis survival skills. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you one of them in a minute. And then the fourth thing is emotion regulation. And as someone who has really out of control emotions, that was a very important module for me because I was all over the place. DBT was originally made by a lady named Marsha Linehan, and she's absolutely brilliant. I've read her autobiography. She's a brilliant person. And she made it for people with very out of control emotions specific to that of borderline personality disorder. But it's also used to treat a wide variety of conditions. People mm -hmm. use it in eating disorders. They use it in bipolar disorder. They use it in depression. And there's even a DBT specifically for addiction. So it's all over oh. the place now. So yeah, so that's that's really, that's the basics of DBT, but my favorite skills are ones that there's a distress tolerance skill called TIP and it's an acronym because DBT is all about acronyms. But the best way I can put it is if you have a bucket, just a bucket of ice water and you're really panicking and everything's really bad and you hold your breath and you dunk your face in the ice water and you hold it there for like 30, 45 seconds, 
And then you get back up, you'll feel better. It's crazy, but it works. Yeah. So, and there's easier ways to do it too. Like you can, go ahead, go ahead. What? No, wait. So let me clarify. You actually take your face and I'm not making fun. I, I just, I need, so if you're having, let's say you, you, your brain is going, you can't stop you getting worse and worse and worse. You will take a bucket of ice water and dip your face in it for 30 to 45 seconds. When I was early in recovery, trying to get my life together. Yes. I Absolutely. did it sometimes multiple times a day. It was, it was intense. Yeah. So it, it, it really works because it's, it activates this thing called the mammalian dive reflex, which is like when mammals and we're mammals, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when you dive, it's like your, your brain goes, Oh my God, we're in water. We need to like slow down our heart rate and our oh. blood pressure and stabilize all our vitals. And so you activate that by dunking your face in the water and it calms your vital signs. So any panic oh. you're feeling, any anxiety you're feeling, it'll go, it'll go away. And there's other ways to do this too. You can yeah. also breathe like breathe in for a little while, like say you breathe in for four seconds and then breathe out for six to eight seconds. That will also calm the vital systems by way of activating your vagus nerve. So, and then there's like, there's there's several skills in that, that whole thing, but the ice water, the ice, ice bucket one is like one of my, one of my favorites because it saved me so many times in my early recovery days. That's awesome. That's awesome. See now living in Wisconsin before Minnesota, now I just go outside in the winter and it was the same thing. But you can also do it with an ice pack on your head, like over your eyes. You can also do it that way. That kind of does it too. I make a joke. You can also about splash it, but... water on your face if you hold your breath. Yeah, so. I was gonna say I make a joke about it, but in one hundred percent reality, I think back and the nights that I was bartending, serving whatever else, and I, like you said, it all goes together. I could not control my emotion from one second to the next, let alone minutes or or, mm -hmm. or hours. I mean, it was just each and everything could set me off and whatever else so you do that all day and it's just popping over the top and now i think back it's like oh my god i used to go hide in the cooler and think that i was just hiding from everybody but now that i when you talk about it, it's like how many of these things that we used to do are actually like oh my body knew what the hell it needed <laughs> and it needed to get out of the, the setting it was in i just didn't know that i was actually benefiting myself but that's interesting so i find that i find that fascinating and i think it's so do you find yourself using a lot of the maybe you don't dunk your head in ice water but do you find yourself if you're having a hard time managing your emotions in that moment doing some of those other splash water in your face uh, the lighter levels of it if you will i'll do the uh, i do this the thing called paired muscle relaxation where it's like okay you breathe in you tense up a part of your body and then you breathe out and relax it you do that over your whole body and that will calm you down that's something i can do like if i'm in a meeting with someone i can do it if i'm sitting at my desk it's not disruptive the breathing trick i also do but those are really only like crisis skills there's also other skills like how to distract yourself there's like essentially an algorithm for distraction as i call it um because there's an acronym for it um and that that really helps too as well but you can't distract too much because then you avoid your emotions you got to deal with them at some point so but another thing good. we also talk about in dbt yeah another thing we talk about in dbt though is like riding the wave of emotions and learning to handle them because me personally, I still struggle with this today. I can't always handle my emotions because they are terrifying. So, so yeah, so I don't splash my face with water all the time, but I do, I do little things when I feel like things are getting a little bit out of control. And I also, I also like fidgeting a lot. So like fidgeting helps a lot too. So that's completely fair. That's good. See, and I love, I love that you said that you can do that in a meeting or at your desk. Cause personally, I forget about that all the time. I, so I, I still like I was in I had an interview last week to get into school. And let's just say that by the end of hour number five, I was shaking a little bit and sweating quite a bit while I was in there in a group of all these people. And I forget that in those moments are exactly when I need to be doing those mindfulness um, exercises. They're not just for crisis, mm -hmm. like you said. Yeah. It's just like, if I start feeling like I, at this point I use DBT skills, like I breathe to the point where I don't always realize I'm, I'm using them. Like there's one skill that talks about how to maintain, improve relationships. It focuses on being gentle, uh, acting interested, validating the other person and having an easy manner. Like that's the actual thing. But in reality, what it looks like is, Hey, how's your kid? How's your life? All right. I listen to you. Hey, you know, you're valid for saying that and, you know, make a joke or two. And that's really like, that's how I deal with relationships, like in the workplace that I not always, you know, good with. So. 
Yeah. Yeah. So it's great. So, it, the DBT skills are all over the place too. They're it, it's it's it basically is just a therapy that changes your whole life. Like it was first told to me by my psychiatrist, and he said, "Just be aware, it's a life changing program." And I'm just like, "Yes, I'm ready for that because my life is horrible right now." Yeah, and that's kind of, but you still have to be willing to continue with it, and I think this so you know i mean i guess what am i trying to say i think people often forget it's a lifelong illness yeah. it's not like we get to fix it or we get to do the dbt and then okay now we've hit this point we have the life skills we're good to go so what is that i guess how do you manage outside of dbt just from a day to day i mean what is i know you've kind of mentioned you have a psychiatrist but what does your team look like i mean how how do you who do you who do you all have that you can go to on a bad day? I mean, I know I got my team keeps growing. I got my girlfriend. She's the first one. Bless her heart. I feel so bad for her because she shouldn't be the <laughs> to take. But, you know, that it's my dad, that it's my godmother, that it's my therapist then my psychiatrist. And, you know, I there's just so many people that I have that I'm able to call or that I keep begging them, whether they listen or not, to help rein me in to also be comfortable enough to tell me you're talking too fast, you seem really down, whatever, things like that. How does that, how do you interact with your team? What does your team look like? And and kind of walk us through that. Cause I'm guessing you have maybe even a few more. Yeah, I have, um, I have a, it took me a long time to get to this point. I want to make that very, very, very clear, but I have a therapist. She's mm -hmm. amazing. She's trained in DBT and CBT. So we do a combination of both. And I see her every week. Um, I have a psychiatrist. He's amazing. I've had him for 10 years. Like he's, he's awesome. Um, and I see him like every six months or so, but in between all that, I have friends that actually do care about me, which is nice. I, I took me a while to get friends that were okay with the fact that I hear voices and maybe fly to other countries on a whim <laughs> sometimes. So it took me a while to get to that point, but I have, I have, um, friends that I have in my hobbies, like I cosplay. That's one of my favorite things to do is I love cosplaying. So I have a lot of friends who are also creative and into cosplay and we'll hang out and I'm like, Hey, I'm like struggling with this. And they'll be like, all right, let's have a crafting day. That type of thing. Like the crafting day coming up, you can come and see us there. And I have friends from college that I talk to online a lot and they're pretty chill too. But my biggest, my biggest support person would probably be my dad who has been with me from day one, for sure. He's, he's been there when like he's, yeah, he, he's just been, I, I lived with him for a very long time. And even now, while I do live alone now, he does live a mile down the road from me. So nice. I'm not too yeah. far from him. Yeah. And he has definitely come over to my apartment when I, when I've needed him. And so he's a big part of it. When I was in a psych ward, like I was stuck in a psych ward <laughs> at one point, uh, he visited me every single day, except for one day when he couldn't make it and he felt really bad about it, but he visited me every single day. And that was like the highlight of like, yes, my dad's here. Yeah. So that was yeah. great. So he's wonderful. And then I have my best friend who I've also known for, um, I've known her since I was two. And it's kind of crazy because she's, she's known me over the course of my whole life. So she's watched me go from being just a girl with cleaning moods to being absolutely psychotic in a tiny apartment in New York. Mm. And the wild thing is that she had a job in an eating disorder facility for a while and they taught DBT there. So she would help teach DBT. So when I was going through DBT and like practicing the skills, she would help me go through them. That's so awesome. I call her and I talk to her about stuff that goes through everything and she's great. Uh, but I mean, I have like, I, I would, I would actually say I have a very large circle of people that I can kind of like spread out the load to so that not one person is overwhelmed and I think that's really important when it comes to a support system is that you're not just relying on one person because if that one person can't be there for you you're screwed that's not a situation you want to be in so yeah and then I have guinea pigs emotional support animals they're they're definitely a part of this picture as well so I love that how many guinea pigs do you have four four nice four guinea pigs yep <laughs> Are you are you planning on having more or is is this like uh are they going to multiply? Because we had guinea pigs when, when I was growing up and those, they multiplied. So I just I want to be I want to give you a word of caution. Keep them separate. I I, I would definitely keep them separate. I only have girls. <laughs> Even better. So I, only, I only I only have girl guinea pigs and the cage can support six, but I'm only going to keep four unless. Someone's like, I have two guinea pigs that I need to get rid of. And I'll be like, I'll take them, give them to me. So, so I would have six in that in that case. I joke, but I don't actually think I've told anybody. I definitely don't think I've said this on Instagram. Definitely not on here. I actually have a uh, bearded dragon. 
um he was my no way she, yeah she was my last hypomanic purchase um before i was <laughs> diagnosed i'm not even kidding i'm not even kidding i believe she, you i totally believe you <laughs> i was diagnosed a month later um but yeah so in 15 16 years of, of up and downs i, I ended up with a uh, bearded jug as my last type of manic purchase i i it was coming out of a depression because like my whole family went out to see my sister and i got really upset by that but i think i made a ton of money then that night at work and so i woke up with like all this energy and all this money in my pocket the next day and i went and bought a bearded dragon and, and she's still with me she's brewmating now which means she's sleeping for months but um which i would like to be doing oh. i'm a little jealous but um yeah where i was going with that though is it's remarkable at least for me, I found, have you found that just having another living being, in your case, four, and cuddly furry ones, unlike mine, but having that responsibility, having something else, is that has that helped you like get out of your own head in, in some ways? Or how, how do they help you? Because I saw by your smile and I see in all of your stories that they mean a lot to you. So what's really great is that so first off, I love that I'm stable enough to have pets. That's that's a big deal to me. And yeah, like that's like, hey, I can take care of four guinea pigs. And the other thing I love about them, besides the fact that they enrich my life and just, are just adorable, like they're just so cute. It's that no matter how I feel, no matter how bad I'm doing, I still have to take care of them. So they provide a level of stability even when I'm unstable because they still have to eat. They still have to get their veggies. They still need water and hay. I can't let them die. So sometimes just if I even, if I can't go to work because I'm too depressed or if I'm really off the wall and whatnot, it's like, no, I still have to do this. So even if I'm like all chaotic up here, I still have to like, you know, okay, narrow it down, got to take care of the piggies. And I'll find myself sitting in my cage with them often. It's a 36 square foot open top cage. So I put down a little blanket and I sit there and then they run around and eat veggies and everything. It's very pure. I love it so much, but they, yeah. So they, that stability that they provide is really important to me. And I hope to have guinea pigs for a very long time because of that. That's, I love that you said that because you flipped it around and I was trying to get there, but you put it in such better words. You flipped around and said that they provide a level of stability because you have to care for them no matter what. How does, like, can you go into that a little bit more? I mean, hmm. It, it, I guess... it's, it's kind of like, it's giving me responsibility when I feel like I don't really, like when I don't, when I want to ignore all my responsibilities, they still have responsibility. Yeah. So yeah. it's, it's kind of like it, that's it's like if everything falls apart, I still have to take care of the guinea pigs. So it's like, it okay, they're, they are the one. Into, yeah, they are the, the one unnegotiable thing that I like. I have to take care of them no matter what. Like there is no there's no okay. like I can not go to work. I can avoid social interactions. I can not pick up the phone when my dad calls me, but I have to take care of the guinea pigs. Mm -hmm. So, And I think that that's such a between that and what you said before that when I I mean, I was what, 33 when I got her. And I might've gotten her a few months too early because I wasn't the best, you know, but, but I was, I'm still, I'm now I'm happy. Like you said, I'm stable enough to have a, a freaking lizard, <laughs> but that's where we were coming from. And I think that's important for people to understand. Like we're not coming from your base level living like a normal, <laughs> like a neuro uh, typical person would be living at whatever age we are. I mean, I feel like I had mm -hmm. so many life skills to catch up to. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like you're just behind in so many different ways is at least how I felt. Did you feel that way as well? Like, be, like especially with you, because it took so long to get the right diagnosis. Did you kind of see like other people kind of like improving and all the things that you wish you could, but it was hard for you to navigate, just let alone your diagnosis and let like your own brain, let alone life itself. Yeah, it was hard because I... I didn't, I was too busy trying to survive and make it through yeah. for a long time. Since I was seven years old, I really wanted to be a doctor and that shaped almost every single thing I did. So I would be absolutely off the wall mentally, but I'd be like, okay, I'm focusing on that. Like I, I have to get this, this, and this. It was like, okay, I want to go to medical school and then got to deal with the mental illness. And it just, there wasn't really a lot of room in between. And I kind of grew up in pieces and parts i'd like to say yeah. i didn't yeah. really get real friends until my senior year of college dbt taught me how to relate to people and it, it's 
And I somehow figured out how to do the whole pay bills, have a bank account, do savings. And like, I got a credit card for the first time six months ago and I'm 28 years old. <laughs> like, you, beat me by, I, you beat me by six years. So don't worry. I was 34. So don't worry for a second. Yeah, but like, killing it. But like, I experienced bipolar symptoms. I have like symptoms of bipolar disorder, like giving me a credit card. That seems like a bad idea. So I avoided it as long as possible. Well, that's better yeah, than what I did. I feel like I, I learned things. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. What did I, you do? Oh, I maxed out two at 18 because I didn't know I lived with bipolar disorder and I was addicted to gambling. So fortunately, I couldn't take out another one, but my credit score was about 485. And I think the first time I checked my credit score at 28, it was like 520 or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so it took me the next eight, six to eight years to get it back to respectable enough to get a credit card. And like you said, I was way too terrified to get one for a really long time. So I think it had been like 18 months after I got diagnosed that I actually think got my first credit card. So I was like, maybe I can handle this. It went okay. Yeah. I, I, I'm so paranoid about forgetting to pay it. Like I have like multiple calendar reminders in my phone. Cause I'm like, please, I gotta do this right kit. You can't mess this up. <laughs> so. so do you have like, cause so that brings an interesting thing. So like, for instance, if I feel like I'm heading into hypomania, the first thing I tell my girlfriend, I'm like, Hey, just make sure I don't go spend too much money. Or like, if I really keep saying, I want this and I want this and I want this, maybe bring it up. What do you, what kind of, is that still something that you deal with? I know you said you were nervous about it. Obviously we all are with bipolar. I mean, I'm guessing you might've overspent here and there once or twice in your life. What kind of barriers? <laughs> <laughs> I hear you go there. What, First of all, if you want to tell us any great stories about that, I'm open to all of them. But then following that up with what kind of barriers do you kind of have now? Like, wh what have you set up so that those types of things don't happen? You'll put those yourself back in those holes. So first off, when I was in the beginning of what would become my psychotic break, I had a who lived a time. And I was talking hey, to her like, hey, I just came and visited you. And two weeks later, I was in Tokyo, <laughs> like two and a half weeks, just like by myself in Japan. I met up with her a lot, but I, I literally like dropped on a plane ticket and I, I stayed in hostels. I, I rode the bullet train. I like walked around. Like I, I got into so much. I, nothing bad happened to me while I was there. It's actually a very safe country. And I plan on going back in the next five years to actually do a planned out trip. But that is definitely the most manic thing I've ever done. And it was so much fun. I had a great time. But I remember being on the plane on the way over there at the beginning of a 15 hour flight, wondering, hey, should I have really done this? So you went from on yeah. the phone with your friend to on a plane to Tokyo in how long? Two weeks. Yep, two weeks. Yep, I I was I was subleasing an apartment in New York, and I had my passport with me because I always carry my passport when I go places. Not like in public normally, but like if I'm going to a city or like a trip for a long period of time. And so yeah, I'm like, I have my passport. On the street, don't try and steal her passport. She doesn't have it on her. <laughs> Please don't steal my passport. I would be very upset. So yeah, yeah, world travel is actually one of my biggest passions. So it's nice. like it's it's not it wasn't my first solo trip. Like I it wasn't just me going to Japan not ha knowing anything about traveling. Like I I know how to travel. I've done a lot of solo traveling, but that was definitely like a uh, hey, maybe you should have thought about that a little bit more. So, but when it comes to like safeguards to prevent overspending and all of that stuff, really I even when I spent a lot of money, it wasn't necessarily big purchases. I remember being in a hypomanic episode at a convention once. It was like an anime convention. And I was really obsessed with this character named Todoroki Shoto from a show called My Hero Academia. And he was this split tone character that I cosplayed. Like I loved cosplaying him. And I got hundreds of dollars worth of prints of him at that con like I just hyper fixated on like every print of him that I could find it was a very popular anime at the time I, I still haven't hung them up on my wall I still have them they're in like a little folder over in my closet but I haven't hung them up or done anything with them and half of them I'm like why did I buy this this is not this is not cool why did I do this <laughs> yeah so re but really these days these days I, I just I, I feel like I'm a little I hesitate to say smarter about it because I do find myself still spending things sometimes that I probably yeah. shouldn't 
but I've been in therapy so long and treatment so long. And yeah, I talk with my dad about the things I buy and my mother too. And, um, it's like, you know, Hey, I'm thinking about buying this. I go through it, that type of thing. Like, and sometimes it's like, Hey, if I want something, I need to wait a week before I buy it. That's another thing. Cause like, what if it is like a little bit of like a hypomanic burst that's trying to make its way out and, you know, I got to make sure I safeguard against that. So, yeah. So I, I'm, unfortunately I've never gone into debt because of my disorder oh. and I hope that never happens. Um, so I've been very fortunate in that sense, but I have bought expensive plane tickets and prints of anime boys. I love your delivery of that, but I have bought a plane ticket, a, a plane ticket to Tokyo, but you know, that's, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's a little different. It's not like a, to the, you know, across the, the country a little bit. No, no, no. Across the, the big pond. Anyways, no, that's, but hyperfix, I guess the only thing I thought of listening to all of that is like, yep, yep, yep. It's so similar. And like, that's, yeah, to yep. kind of come back to the beginning getting in some ways and kind of start closing things out it's like that that's what's so important you know and i i again thank you for being open about these questions about living with schizoaffective disorder because until i found your account kit i didn't know what it was i didn't i figured they were two separate things in all honesty yeah, I did. I I wasn't aware of it. So you are absolutely educating a ton of people out there. Now I want to kind of ask: Is there speaking of that? Is there anything else about schizoaffective disorder, psychosis, anything along those lines that you want people to know? Because my entire goal, you see it on if anybody the hundred subscribers we have now, <laughs> as you put it out earlier, on the banner that it says eliminate the stigma. That is my my only goal. So what are, if there's anything you want to leave with people that they should know to help eliminate this thing, because I've stood here for 45 minutes with you. And I think one of my, the thing that you wouldn't be able to tell at all that you're different from anybody else, you know, and that's not, that shouldn't be a compliment to you or I, I actually kind of hate it when people say that. It's like, yeah, no kidding. I'm a person who lives with bipolar disorder. But I say that because it's so important. So what is there anything you want to leave leave us with, leave people with about schizoaffective disorder psychosis? Well, for me specifically, I went from losing absolutely everything. I lost my friends. I lost uh, my dream. I lost another dream. I lost my apartment. I lost a bunch of stuff. Like just, yeah, it, it, I, I lost everything because of my disorder. And I ended up in a psych ward. I was self-harmed to the point where I was, possibly going to kill myself. And I, there was a lot of bad stuff going on. And I was really at the bottom at that point. And the thing is, a lot of people who seek help or are forced to seek help are in that bottom, but that's not what it's like all the time. And recovery is possible. For me, it took a lot, a lot, a lot of work. And not every person with schizoaffective disorder looks like me. Not everyone can live alone and have a full-time job. There's a lot of, it's, it's a spectrum of what you can do and what you can't do. And no person is better than the next. But my whole message that I want to get out there about just schizoaffective disorder in general is that it's not a death sentence. It's not the end of your life. And while it might have ruined your life and taken a lot of what you cared about, it you can still come back from it. You can still chase dreams they might be different than what you had before my whole life changed with my diagnosis and everything like it 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 got turned on its head but i i want to i want to be proof that you can come back from having a severe really severe deep psychotic break and then be the person you see here who can laugh and smile and talk about her life and just be a generally i don't know content person like i person. i, I, I yeah. You, yeah just just another person out there that is just living life and everything like i'm not i'm not only my voices i'm not only my manic episodes i'm not only my depression i'm that but i'm also kit someone who loves cosplay and loves traveling and has a lot to offer the world you mm -hmm. know and i mean i i i guess then then maybe i, I just want to hit this because i've heard you say it twice and it's something that when i look back I, I, I'll just tell you, I ended up living with my parents for a couple of years when I was 28, 29 and 30, almost three years. I think I moved back in with them mm -hmm. after I, I, I can say I lived on my own for 10 years, but I miserably failed at trying to be a human for 10 years would really be the only way of summing that up until I moved back in with my parents. 
But for a lot of people, especially those of us who live with severe mental illness, living on our own can be the first huge step and one that some people will never be able to make. And so that's why I appreciate you bringing that up multiple times and why I try and say, like, bring up like, hey, literally paying my bills, like you said earlier, is a big step. Being able to organize mm -hmm. my life enough to be able to remember to pay my bills is like a huge thing. <laughs> so we have to remember that like, whatever somebody is doing, whatever level they're reaching, it's different for everybody. It's it's just a different- And everybody. whatever level they're at. Yeah, whatever level they're at, wherever level anyone who's listening to this is at, you're valid and you're not alone. Yes, and you're killing it. <laughs> you're doing a great job. You're surviving. And, and I, I said that at one of my speak, you're surviving. Congratulate yourself for being here. I don't care who you are, you've been through. Think of everything you've been through your whole life Yes. See that kind of energy. Exactly. Because you've made it. I mean, I've only heard bits and pieces of what you've been through and you're here and that should be celebrated. Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> well, Kit, thank you so much. I, I guess we'll wrap things here. I just, I cannot thank you enough for being so open. If you have so many more subscribers and followers than I do. So, but if any of mine haven't found you yet, they need to. Schizo Kitzo on both YouTube and IG. Is that correct? Those are the best places mm -hmm. to find you. And, and Facebook and Twitter. <laughs> and Facebook yeah. and Twitter. So you're everywhere. And yeah. excuse I'll me, just... X, X. <laughs> Whatever it is. <laughs> that that one thing. But no, but seriously, her videos are great. They're a lot shorter than mine. So people will probably watch more of <laughs> the whole thing, which is good. But they're interesting. You're you're so honest and that I have not seen, I'll, I'll say this. I want my videos that I try and do on the side. I, my intention are be as honest and, and forthcoming as you are. The, the emotion that they bring out of people, I have to assume when they watch it, it was visceral for me. And it really brought me into your world and gave me a better understanding. So if anybody's watching this, go follow it. Okay? It's incredible and just appreciate everything. Thank you for being on. And uh, hopefully we will uh, be able to do this again soon. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Lee. Thanks, Kate.